one of the things I was most keen to ask you about is your sense of where you fit into the perennial English social stratification and what's happened to it. And one of the things that's happened to it is people like you. I think people in the arts and the media have had a, played a large part in revolutionising the whole business. There's been a realignment um, of prestige, in other words. Well, I, I think of myself as socially and geographically rootless. Um, you must know this, that when, when, when your father moves out of the ranks through the sergeant's mess and becomes an officer, you, you get a new posting. You have to change all your friends. And those officers, those who came through the ranks, were always rather looked down upon by the Santos types. And they lived in a, in a sort of strange social vacuum. I was sent off to a rather strange and classless um, experiment of a boarding school where they took working-class kids from central London, from broken homes, out into the country in a sort of imitation uh, public school. Uh, this was a state boarding school, and sent them all to university. Then I went to a brand-new university. So socially, I was never able to quite place myself. And because of my past of different army postings and boarding school, I never had any place either in England that... Um, Did you resent that? No, I think it's a great liberation yeah. in some way. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure you do in retrospect. I'm thinking about at the time, were you made to feel... No, that, I never that there felt were, any of that. There were no. taller, I always thought there were taller, blonder boys just on the other side. Of the Even in Australia, yeah. public I, school boys, so-called yeah. they were private school boys in Australia, they were sort of bigger than us. I was maybe a little chippy when I, I went off to Sussex University and there, there were kids there who everyone else seemed to agree were very important. <laughs> but I could never quite... It's it, a lot it, of fun it, joking it, they it are. irritated <laughs> me enormously. I could never see what the J-twins were, well, were about. Uh, and I'm sure I would have had a much harder time at Oxford or Cambridge. And you would have had a terrible time before the war yeah. because things were already changing. Yeah. But I, uh, I admire those writers who do have a place, like, you know, Chicago for Bellow or you know, yes. Pennsylvania or Connecticut for Updike or whatever. Uh, but the test in, in, in Britain, isn't it, is whether you admire Evelyn War for having his place in the, the landed gentry. We're, we're living at a time where the old order has suffered such a comprehensive defeat. It's like the meltdown of the Soviet Union. The Tory party, for example, has practically ceased to exist, mainly because its constituency has melted. There aren't enough landed gentry to vote. Well, my delight at that, I still, I, I still sort of like a heat-seeking missile, I can't resist another crisis in the Tory party. That, that's where I would turn <laughs> to first. I still haven't quite forgiven them those 18 years. You set up a little cheer. But coming back to Evelyn War, well, we will forgive him for writing well, so yes. we don't mind that he was you know, curmudgeonly old That's bastard. what Orton said about Paul Claudel, um, we forgive yeah. him for writing well. well. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's the greatest modern English prose writer. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to beat. But he was an extremely nasty person, and yeah. he was represented, uh, in fact, even fellow members of the system said it wasn't quite as nasty as he made it seem, just simply yeah. by being in it. But there was no doubt that the old gang was still well in charge uh, after the war, and to a certain extent they willed their own destruction. They're, they're, the, the modification of the old system was... You can give them that. It was in part their creation, the beverage port, report and so on. And it's, it's, it's become a fairer society. But uh, I think one of your diehard toffs and Tories, I think it's in The, the Child in Time, Lord, Lord Palmerton. Palmerton, yeah. He's, he's a sort of unreconstructed bigwig, isn't he? And he? He's got the opinion that the country's suddenly full of the wrong people. Yeah, well, he was sort of modelled on um, Alec Douglas Hume. He with those rather snakish lips and... Uh, perfectly sort of stiff upper lip. Yeah. Didn't move an inch when he talked. And I rather admired that in people. Uh, purely, not socially, but just uh, it was a great feat to be able to talk without it's a, moving a top it's lip. A big question that I want to raise. Is there a possibility that some of your material as a novelist is disappearing? Because the, the old social stratification were handy. Well, I, I, I think there are remnants, and, and they're quite interesting too. I mean, our profession still dominated by Oxford, um, extraordinarily, and Cambridge in second place. Well, I actually went, in my mind, I went through uh, the writers of our yeah. generation, and, the, and they're all practically all Oxford and Cambridge, yeah. except you, as a matter of fact. Yeah, well, it, it is odd, isn't it? Yeah. Um, something, something still hangs on there. So I don't think it's completely collapsed. 
um, you can't quite place people now. And I, but I think this adds to the social soup. Yeah. You can no longer place people simply because they have a glottal T. Yeah. They, they could be, you know, they could be f lecturers in philosophy. Or, they could be faking it. One thing, they could be Mick Jagger. Yeah. Yeah. How much of your career did you see when you, I don't say at school, but at you know, sort of East Anglia Creative Writing School uh, alumnus, really, because yeah. it was a very, very intense atmosphere. All, all these guys were novelists. You were surrounded. Well, who, who did you have around you? Angus Wilson? Uh, Angus Wilson, Malcolm Bradbury. Yeah. And all they cared about, it, so it seemed, was me, because I, I was the only student. <laughs> This is the first program ever to reveal this fact. This is all, all student. They, <laughs> they'd closed the course down. It was the very first year. No one had applied. And very late in the summer holidays, I applied. And they were very glad to have me. And uh, I had a fantastic year because I had two real writers reading my stuff. They gave me no direction. They just say, that's fine. When's the next? I often think that the Bradbury and David Lodge School, I, I think I was the first ever to call it the Lodgebury School of Novel. It's terrifically under, underestimated. And uh, it's a wonderful body of work. And it all comes out of this one part of England, really. And actually, um, you know, it's terrible that Malcolm should die just as his career, I think, was... He, ha he had a sort of period of writing choppily, short novels responding to political events. Yeah. Um, and then he settled down to much more serious work again and then uh, passed away. But David, I mean, I think thinks, uh, it's extraordinary how David is endlessly restless, uh, intellectually curious yeah. as, as a novelist. And, and writing about the novel. He's one of the few people yeah, who write sense about it. Writes about it. They've just written on novel and consciousness. Yes. I see it's about to come out. Um, but thinks is a real engagement with you know, evolutionary psychology and cognitive psychology. Uh, and it's funny. And still milking um, that campus novel world. I mean, he does it well. Was there an atmosphere of prof professionalism? Were you given advice on your career and when to do no. the short stories, when to do the novels? Was it? No, it was nothing like that. Because in retrospect, it's all been perfectly timed. You know, you've got your short story collections. You build up a thirst for a novel, and then a the novel appears. If anyone was sort of looking back on it and saying how McEwen planned his career, it would have a terrific shape. But actually, when you're living it, it's more by accident, isn't it? Totally. I mean, I just held out till I had a novel to write. There was nothing more than that. I just didn't have the right uh, stuff. But um, no one at, at, at East Anglia gave that kind of advice. There was... Uh, an experimental writer called Alan Burns, uh, published by John Calder, that kind of writer. And he said to me, it's the only advice anyone ever gave me, he said, you completely misuse the comma. <laughs> um, he said, you've read too much Beckett. The comma is not a full stop. He was dead right. I think uh, attainment is a very, it's got a, it's got a, a rich, willfully nostalgic flavor, rather like Brideshead. And I just wondered if you weren't getting back into the vanished image and enjoying it and enjoying your the fact that you can now inhabit it at will, as it were. There's a I, lot about the know, writer's will in attainment, isn't there? Mm. But I, I could write myself into that world, but uh, at the same time, I had to give that world something of my own rootlessness. I mean, the family who have that house, the house is plug ugly because it, yeah. you know, it burnt down. The Adam house burnt down long ago. The family only goes back two or three generations before it disappears into sort of bog laborers who so can't they're not, even be traced. They're not Midford-style yeah. toffs. No, 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 no they're no, not no. real toffs. And I think partly that was, uh, I just didn't want to research all that stuff. I didn't want to know about it. Well, see, the, the great advantage of someone like Paul is they didn't have to. No, yeah. quite. So but you Paul, right. Paul once told me that he wasn't really, a, wasn't really a snob and it was only an accident that the, that the Brit and the Almanac that go to on the shelves and he'd just be, he'd just be, as in, he'd be just as interested in a multi-volume work called Burke's Workers, yeah. which I thought was a good joke. But it wasn't true. These, these, these guys were saturated with that stuff. And, you, and if you try and, and mug it up, you do nothing but make mistakes anyway, because mm. it, it consists, the whole virtue of it is that all these little particles have to be correct, but worth it. You have to work with what you've got. Yeah. So if you've got that background, you know, we'll, again, just judge you whether you write well or not. Yeah. Let's take another example, David Hare, a writer of your generation. I think of you as a generation younger than my generation, because I'm older. Uh, but born those crucial few years after the war, 
And uh, it's your interpretation of the war fascinates me. You did a TV play about uh, Bletchley Park. It was uh, yeah. the Imitation Game. The Imitation Game. game. Yeah. Yeah. Well remembered. Uh, well, I, re I reviewed it. I was a TV critic. And I, I think I'm quoted on the jacket as having called it a distinguished play, which is, uh, indeed it was. Yeah, I remember you said uh, she ended up behind bars, but she was behind bars all the time. <sighs> Did I say that? Yeah. Yeah, what a talent I had in those uh, days. It became, but, a, <laughs> it, beca it became a sort of little catchphrase. It was faded now, but uh, in Martin, we were talking about when people were sort of heavily constrained socially, we say, ended up behind bars. She was behind bars all the time. Gosh, and I said it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I got literally, a word I rarely use, literally hundreds of letters from women who had been in Bletchley Park. Mm saying, uh, we enjoyed the play too, but it wasn't like that because we never felt that we were being looked down, down on by the men and so on. And they were quite vehement about it. And they said they understood the need to know principle, blah, blah, blah. But the principal thing they said is that we, in no way were we meant to feel that we were being pushed and marginalised because we were mm. women. Now, were they right? Or were you right? Or was it possible for you both to be right? Maybe they just didn't see their true situation. Well, I, I interviewed a handful of those ladies. Um... Only one book had appeared at that point, and it was Peter Calvacressi's book. That's right. Hodges, not even Hodges' book on Turing had no, come out the other no, no, I went to see Hodges. Which I read on your, re your recommendation, and it would just change my mind about all kinds of things. Yeah. You, you, you went to, yeah. I went to see Hodges, yeah. And he was halfway through that book. Uh, those, um, even then, quite elderly ladies were talking for the first time, and most of them had not even spoken to their husbands. I mean, that principle of uh, respect for secrecy laws ran very, very deep. No, and I, I think that their view of it was um, coloured or animated by the fact that they felt that they had done really significant war work. Yeah. But there were 10,000 of those women working in and around Bletchley. There were a handful of very gifted women in the hut. All I was saying was that distribution of, of, of labour and gender simply mirrored something outside. It was, you know, in that sense, unexceptional. Well, I, I don't think you were precisely questioning the, uh, the country's folk memory of having attained solidarity during the war. Mm. You were saying that the, the women were underestimating the, the, the degree to which they were being patronised. David Hare went much further. He said that the, uh, the, the solidarity was absolutely fake, that the, the, working, the working class were being screwed as usual. Yeah. Well, we were all, I have to say, at that point, terribly taken with Angus Calder's book, People's War, yeah. uh, which in many ways is a brilliant but, but politically loaded social history of the home front. Still a marvellous book. I mean, I, I dipped back into it, uh, writing Atonement, and was surprised by how much I'd forgotten, but how, how, what an estimable book it was. But it, it rather coloured, I think, our generation's view that there was something maybe deliciously transgressive in having another look at the war, not as a moment of heroic solidarity, which, you know, that was there too, but to look at all the things that were, were it wrong the, about it. It was the key line of Beyond the Fringe, wasn't it? We need a futile gesture at this stage. Yeah. That was the beginning of the subversion. It was a very useful subversion. Yeah. I just wondered that the, that the consequences running all the way up to now, where the old system is virtually collapsed in a way I never quite expected. And you're, you're faced with what the, the old Tories would now call a yob culture. Mm. And is this to any degree a consequence of deconstructing the, the old folk memory? I think it's time. I mean, the, the thing is, when Hare and I were writing in the 70s, uh, everybody knew about the war. Yeah. I mean, all generations knew about it. Now... Um, the, the, the active combatants are dying off and the children remember it, but the grandchildren, as it were, uh, are, are free of it. They have other concerns. Or they may have a new war on their hands yeah. or they may be able to relate yeah. to any previous one. Um, so I, I think it's more, it's more that. Back in the mid-70s, you could, you could rely on a consensus about the war so that you could run against it. Yeah. Uh, and there were marvellous things that called a tortoise about for example, right at the beginning of the war, during the evacuation time when the children were sent out into the country, it was a moment in which the country learned about the state of its working classes. Yes. That they, you know, 
loads, loads of these kids never had eaten with a knife and fork, didn't know what a cow was. I remember what even War wrote about it in one of his novels. The worst thing that could happen yep. to yep. a bunch of these kids would then have a wreck your house. <laughs> yeah. No, he's very good on that. Yeah. But uh, you might say now that the house wreckers are in charge. But it's, society is much more unruly now than it was when I got here. Forty years ago, it was still something out of tip-top comic. You, you could walk the streets unchallenged. You were safe. There were, and when I now see that was a hangover, and yeah. society was about to change and, and, and change radically. And you now might say, if you wanted to be, if you wanted to start a new controversy, the the country really is full of the wrong people. I went down to the local uh, shop down here. It's run by a wonderful family called the Patels. Most new, good news agents are run by a family called the Patels, and the racial division was fantastic. Um, Behind the counter with the Patels, these fantastically distinguished, well-educated people, and queuing up to buy their children meals of sweets was the working class that the Labor, old Labour Party had once hoped to improve the condition of, and it manifestly hasn't worked. The people on this side of the counter buying their children meals of sweets were the, were, were the big brother consumers. And what is to be done? And I'm, I'm putting what I would say yeah. to the conservative view. We said this conservative view doesn't really exist. It doesn't come from a conservative party. I, I think you can take this too far, Clive. I mean, I'm trying that, to. <laughs> that sense, that sense of living in decline, you know, afflicts, afflicts us all. It's one of the sort of yeah. things that happen as you get older. Um, it comes with grunting as you lower yourself. Into yes, it. I agree. It's all with part it. of that. There's, there's I mean, no you, question. I'm in many ways turning into a dreadful old fart. I remember going but to deliver copies of the new review with with, with Zandra Hardy. And I was amazed, and this was 1974, how few bookshops there were in London. Yeah. How, how many bookshops there are now? Yeah, how true. many people read? The sales of paperback books, the queues to get in to see the latest, you know, Some, the, to get into the game. Something book. I'm fond of pointing out to people who complain about too many branches of Starbucks. There are also too many branches of bookshops. It's yeah, wonderful. Try and get a ticket to Twelfth Night at the Dumbo, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, yes, all that's going on. There is an underclass and it, you know, it needs rescuing or someone's got to do something. But there is a sort of, you know, 35% of the kids now go to university. When I was at university, it was 8%. And I don't buy the more or less, um, especially since I'm uh, someone who now and then will have a paperback book for sale on, in the bookshops. And those kids who've been through universities are more likely to want to read it. Well, despite my would-be searing image of the newsagents, <laughs> I think that... Uh, the underclass, if, you, if that was the word anyone wants to use, uh, not only can be reached but was being reached by the broadcasting system. Uh, this, is, this is the penalty of the old system crumbling, is that many representatives of the old system, they used to be called the great and good, when they were in charge of the broadcasting apparatus, were wedded to the notion that during the evening's programming something entertaining should be followed by something hard and everybody's level should be raised, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it was dismantled, not so much by the radical left, but by the radical right. Rupert Murdoch gave his historic McTaggart lecture when mm. he said, yeah, who are these people to decide what people shall see? And that was the beginning of the broadcasting system becoming what it is now, which is thoroughly atomized. But if you heard an old tape of um, workers' playtime or whatever <laughs> it, was, it <laughs> went down in the mid-50s of you know, what Reith decided... Um, and put, ran it against a, an episode of EastEnders, yes. which I think people generally do watch. I want to call you on that one. Do you really watch it? EastEnders? No, of course not. Yeah. Well, in fact, I, re I withdraw that, of course. Yeah. I don't watch much telly, but... Um, you, you were presumed. You know, I'm told, I'm yeah. reliably informed that it's actually not bad. And, actually, I, And lots of people watch it. Maybe the, the so-called yob culture isn't as bad as old curmudgeons like me tend to think. After all, its values aren't that bad. There's not a constant riot. We're, we're not talking about Nazi times. It's amazing what, what, what people don't do when you think about it. Yeah, it was squashed into a city. It was quite surprising. I mean, look, think of the yobs that are coming back to Evelyn War. It's interesting. He's come up so many times. Um, what's the novel? It begins with a trashing of a room. Um, yes, and the climaxes in, in with a wonderful yes. scene where the man in the quadrangle vomits in through the window into yeah. the guy's room. Yeah, and of course he gets sent down. <laughs> and he's the one who gets yeah. thrown out. And typ well, typ war, typical war. of a war hero, he, he does not complain. War understood, upper class, yobbery. But uh, I just, it's a very, very bad position to put myself in, but there is such a thing as a yob culture, and it bores me to death, and it, it fills the airwaves, it fills the media, it fills the streets, 
and I don't see or hear anything I like, and sometimes I just want to run and, and hide under Norman Tebbard's wing. I don't know how you get to hear so much of it. I mean, if you don't watch much telly, um, then you don't come across it, and you don't have to go out and buy the sun. Um, well, that's true. You, but you, could, you, know, you could be reading Virgil's uh, clothes. And, you know. Well, I usually am. <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying to put an extreme view. We we saw uh, well, the last telly we saw was last night. Ian Holm in the in the homecoming, um, marvelously sinister. And I thought, I rethought for the first time in, in quite a while. Actually, it's great having a telly and watching it. Uh, it's very very entertaining. I ju I just think you have to be aware of feeling that you live at the end of. of of civilization's rope. I don't really. I, I am turning into an old curmudgeon, or indeed the word old fart is appropriate. Uh, but the only thing I find, after 40 years, I think behavior in the street is far less aesthetically pleasing than it was. But there is one real difference, is the crime rate has gone up. The petty crime rate has gone up. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess the drug consumption rate's gone up. I mean, talking hard drugs here and... Um, it seems there's been a useful connection made. At least it suggests one way forward about the crime rate. If people are robbing houses and mugging people in the street to feed their habits, then clearly you know, at least there's some way forward. Yeah. You could start addressing that. And anyway, there was always upper-class drug taking, which brings us back to you, because in 1973, didn't you hit the hippie trail? Was that a psychedelic... No, not at all. 1972 it was. Yeah, I, I bought a a bus, a Volkswagen bus in Amsterdam with two American friends and we drove to Munich and Istanbul. You realize how open and free the world was then, right across uh, Turkey and... Afghanistan. And, no, Libya. no, Iran first. Yeah. A long time in Iran. Yeah. Um, was this a psychedelic trip? I always got the impression that it might have been. Not psychedelic. It was, well, there was a bit of psychedelia along the way, but um, it was mostly standard hashish and after several months on the road um, I longed for a, a cloudy sky um, <laughs> and um, a little room in a sort of provincial town in which I could sort of order my thoughts I, I felt I would not think straight until I got out from under the sun um, yeah. get into the northern or the western hemisphere again and that's what I, I did I, I sort of cut out of the trip um, after six months and was so pleased to fi rent a little apartment in Norwich and uh, get a rather bare room and a, some, a stack of uh, empty pages and back start McEwen, writing again. Back to McEwen land. I think it's an extension, uh, it's a, a sign of the extent to which I become acclimatized after 40 years that I actually miss the, after two weeks in Australia I start longing for the rain. And yeah, it helps you think. <laughs> How do you stay indoors when it's too beautiful? I had something brilliant I was going to say then, I totally forgot it. Uh, well, we'll believe you. Yeah, give me half a minute off, because it's too good to miss. There's a great passage uh, by William James on not being able to remember something, and the quality of it. You know what it isn't. All the things that suggest it, so you know exactly. So it's shape. It's, it, um, I'll send it to you, maybe if you give me your email, because it is the perfect knowing passage on forgetting. Uh, you think that's going to make you remember? Ah... Uh, Thank you. So you're, you're content to be here writing in McEwen land, but what about the lure of Hollywood? Doesn't the, is the Hollywood swimming pool ever attractive? I know you've been in the movies. You've written movies. They were nice, rainy British movies, didn't it? But there was... No, I, I've done some Hollywood movies, uh, one of which got made, a Macaulay Culkin movie. Uh, I gave up. I went into a... I'm still in it, a kind of sulk. Uh, I've you got the, two scripts unmade, and I you, thought that's too many for me. You know, a whole bunch of writers that have known each other for years. I think there are only two perfectly honest men about their careers. It's you and Jay Reed. And you once said, you came in, uh, I think it was the Groucho, and said, I've just been fired by Bertolucci. Yeah, yeah. See, nobody else I knew would have said that. They would have said, Bertolucci and I have had agreement, a disagreement, or that mad Italian. But you yeah, plus which he fired me in the Ritz um, <laughs> over a bottle of champagne. And, and I... I said, well, well, why? He said, well, I, I, I decided to go to China. He said, 
and in fact, he went on to make the Last Emperor, and I went on. To Last write Emperor. It. Were, you, were you writing that? Or? No, I was writing uh, a Moravia novel, um, but turning it into a it was a comedy about fascism, um, and uh, it was a bit like a sort of Lubitsch film. Some of your stuff is so filmic. Anyway, what's the one about the tunnel under Berlin? Oh, the Innocent. No, that was Either. a terrible film. We made that. Uh, you probably haven't. But the novel. Even, I've never seen yeah, the movie, but the novel was. heard of the movie. And yet, yeah. Tony Hopkins, Isabella Rossellini, Campbell Scott. He's in a tunnel. Schlesinger. He's in a tunnel and he finds Isabella, Isabella yep. Rossellini. I haven't seen it. What went wrong? Uh, well, it was a terrible movie. I wrote it. Um, John Schlesinger directed it very irritably. And it just was no good. These um, things. Movies just take up so much time for, for the return. For a writer, too. It's not a writer's medium. It's a director's medium. Yeah. You're a hired hand. You can be sacked at any minute. Who did The Plowman's Lunch? Was that Richard Eyre? Yeah. yeah. Now, that was my first. And That must have spoiled you because yeah. Richard's so sensitive. Right? Everything that we said we'd do, we did. Yeah. Um, I showed Richard a couple of pages of a, of a synopsis. He said, yeah, that's the kind of film I'd like to make. Four months later, we were shooting it. Uh, Forty days after that, we were editing it. Then it was in the... Little did you know at the time, it's never like that. Yeah, I <laughs> thought, this is a life. I will write a novel every two or three years, and, and in between, I'll write a movie. Um, so the next thing was Bertolucci. And from then on, it went downhill. I had one good little moment, again, a movie no one ever saw, but with Mike Newell. Uh, and it was a Timothy Moe novel called Sound of Sweet, which I think is a fabulous novel. All Chinese cast. Um, and even when... You know, even when a movie like that gets made, it had marvellous reviews, but ten days in the cinema and it was gone. Whereas the novel is there, yeah. and there, and there, and there. You get to decide the weather and yeah. the characters. You, nothing is mediating it. And it's a thing, and people keep it. I've got a stack of books for you to sign, and you can't do that with a movie. Okay. Sign the movie. No, you can't. <laughs> you turn up to the premiere. No, there's, there's not enough satisfaction for a writer in, in movies, unless you direct yourself. I remember a dear departed and irascible friend, Kingsley Amos, saying, always have a new one on the go, and then they can't hurt you through the one you've got. Yeah. Have you got, you've got one on the go? Just about, yeah. Um, but always having a new one on the go, I think that you run risks there, that you're just going to repeat the old one. You've got to let it go. Well, well next time you're here, I'm going to pump you about it anyway. But uh, thank you very much, Ian McEwen. Thank you, Clive, for having me.